Hello, thank you all for coming. Uh, this talk is about using Python to get an old printer from 1988, 1987, working again. So, 1988, we had the IBM PS2, uh, the Macintosh 2, and Steve Jobs was actually working on the Next Cube, which came out. So this is quite a while ago. Um, these systems might somewhat resemble uh, what we have today. Uh, the PS2 gave us things like VGA, which is still something of a standard. And then, of course, uh, the next cube is the lineage of Mac OS X. But that was on the high end. Uh, those systems cost many thousands of dollars. Uh, on the low end, and we're still talking, you know, $500, uh, are the Commodore 64 and the Apple IIe, which were still on sale at the time. Um, these systems were available at Sears, Montgomery Ward, uh, stores like that. You could also mail order them. Also, a lot of schools were using these systems. Uh, as far as the internet goes, we, it, was, it was around, but as far as consumers go, there was a product called Quantum Link. Uh, this is an advertisement from the Computes Gazette article about uh, the early online service called Quantum Link. Uh, Quantum Link is the precursor to America Online. It was available as kind of like a, a graphical interface for the Commodore computer. Um, we also had our hometown CompuServe. Uh, CompuServe uh, was one year away from offering internet email in 1989. Um, I spent a lot of time over the last several couple years um, trying to go back into this time because I had a lot of family media. Um, about 10 years ago, I worked with um, oh, uh, VHS tapes, digitizing old home video VHS. And in the past couple of years, I've been trying to go through our old magnetic media, so floppy disks uh, and whatnot. Uh, you'll be happy to know that currently on Amazon, you can get uh, a USB three and a half inch drive. Um, so if you have any old three and a half inch discs, I found that we didn't have very many. The the three and a half inch discs sort of overlapped with the available uh, availability of uh, CD-ROM drives, burnable CDs. So a lot of the stuff that I have been storing on three and a half inch discs, I either transferred over to CD or I just got rid of them once I started burning CDs. But we still had uh, a whole bunch of five and a quarter discs, and get those, getting those working is a little bit more involved. Uh, you have to get a USB adapter uh, device that will interact with a TAC drive. It seems to be kind of the standard right now. You're looking around $100, $150 to get in the business of reading these discs. Um, if you have any and you think there's anything valuable, I highly recommend it because this media is wearing out. Um, one thing that these uh, drives don't do, however, is they don't read what was called flippy disks. They don't read the back side of a disk. The, the IBM disks were double-sided, so you put it in one way, it would read both sides simultaneously. But with the Commodore disk drive, you had to actually take the disk out and flip it around the other way. And um, so the, the IBM style drives can't read that. So, I also wound up buying one of these Commodore disk drives off of eBay, usually around $50 to $100, um, maybe less, maybe more. There's also some uh, clone drives as well out there. Um, interfacing with this is a little different. Um, I, uh, it seemed kind of weird to have one of these drives and not have a Commodore. So I also looked around on Craigslist and found uh, a Commodore for sale. Um, one of the things... Uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I just what, from the expense of this stuff, or no? I, I guess I've been somewhat bored or something, or nostalgia, trying to go back through all this stuff. Um, the Commodore was only about a hundred bucks. I met a guy out in Lancaster, about 45, 50 minutes away, uh, in a racks parking lot, uh, and he, for a hundred dollars, gave me the Commodore, um, and actually an SD card reader cartridge thing, which is. Um, I think new, worth like $40, $50 in its own right, uh, but also a CRT monitor, one of the actual Commodore monitors as well. So it was actually not that bad of a deal for what I was getting. But he also said, hey, I've got this printer, uh, which I wasn't really looking to get, 
And he had everything with it. He had uh, the cables and a big stack of the, you know, the fan fold paper and everything. And I said, all right, I'll give you 20 bucks for it or something. So I packed that up in my car. Uh, it all smelled a lot like cigarette smoke. So I had to, <laughs> had to go to the drugstore, get some garbage bags, put that in there. Um, luckily, I think it was just in his car. I don't think the stuff was stored around uh, smoking. So it did all eventually air out very, fairly well. So this printer, I got to reading about it. Uh, this is from uh, the same Computes Gazette magazine from the Internet Archive that I showed the uh, uh, America Online Precursor Quantum Link ad earlier. Uh, they had a review of this line of printers. They said it was pretty good, except don't try to underline anything. That'll cause it to freak out. And every time I print a page, it also likes to freak out. But if I turn it off and turn it back on, it works just fine. Uh, they, they overall thought it was a great printer. So. Uh, Anyway, so that was a, a different time. Um, looking at these here, on the left here, we see an ad for this line of printers. Um, you got to look at these 1988 prices as almost being somewhere around 50% of the prices today. So uh, this printer would have been around um, oh, $460 or so. And you could get the whole suite of um, uh, the printer, the computer, the, the lower end the printer, uh, the newer version of the Commodore, and a clone drive for around $480 in 1988, which is almost about a grand a day. So um, this, these things weren't exactly cheap, um, but they weren't necessarily out of reach of the home consumer. So what is a, a, a dot matrix printer? A dot matrix printer uh, is a series of solenoid pins on a on a stepper motor like path um, rail. And this head moves along, and as it reaches certain parts along that, it, it moves the solenoids and actually presses the pins through a ribbon onto the paper and causes a mark. Um, this was about the best image uh, I could find. Uh, this came from some, uh, f I think it was the free dictionary or something. That's essentially what's going on here, uh, much like a typewriter, but instead of a typewriter, we actually have a grid of pins. Um, there were seven pin, nine pin, 18 pin. When I was a kid, I don't know if we were, I don't know, I guess I was sort of well off, but we had a 24 pin, uh, and it was, it was pretty nice, high resolution. Um, uh, this printer, however, uh, that I got was a nine pin. Uh, lasers and inkjets also did exist in 1988. On the Internet Archive, there's an issue of Computer Chronicles for Comdex of December 1988. And they talked about uh, laser printers from HP. Uh, the Apple Laser Writer had been out for several years. Um, Wikipedia says that it would cost 15 grand in today's money when it came out in 85. The inkjet, I was thinking, I think I heard on the Computer Chronicles episode, uh, was the equivalent of 30 grand in today's money for that inkjet. And it was only, I want to say, uh, 200 DPI or something like that. So um, it's amazing that it can go from such expense to being the overall large scam that it is nowadays. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so the technology was around there. It was just uh, expensive. Um, so here we are in 2018, we're 30 years later. I almost said 20 years earlier, uh, later when I was thinking earlier, and then I was like, no, this is 30 years. Um, so to interface with that uh, disk drive, we had these connectors, the DING connector. Um, I think it was that number of pins, one, two, three, four, five, five pin. You know, I think it's maybe a nine pin that's on these drives. Um, anyway, you might have seen this in MIDI cables, although a lot of MIDI is just USB now. Um, but this is still a standard. You can still get these cables uh, through DigiKey and whatnot. Uh, but to actually talk to the disk drive, uh, I got this device on the left here, which uh, costs like 30, well, I was trying to think 30, somewhere around like $50, 30, 30 to $50. And what it is, is you can kind of barely see it. There's a, a, US, a micro USB um, connector sort of in the center left edge and then on the top there is a DIN 9 connector um, and then at the bottom is the um, 
Well, honestly, I don't know what that's for. I think it's for, for another serial interface. But anyway, this device converts uh, universal, uh, universal serial bus signals into the old uh, Commodore IEC uh, serial, and there's a lot to do with timing and that kind of thing. I also found a nice case for it on uh, eBay. I got a 3D printed this, so we really are kind of in the future here. Um, so how, again, how this connects, you connect your PC or your laptop or your Raspberry Pi to the Zoom floppy, and then it can talk to the disk drive using this serial bus that the Commodore supported. Um, also, that included uh, the printer interface as well. So on Linux, to talk to these devices, there is uh, a special set of suite called OpenCBM or Open Commodore Business Machines, and um, this is uh, the um, the man page for one of the control programs um, to interact with these devices. Um, this allows you to open the device and like read and write from it, lock the device from other devices, and such like that. It's very much a command line thing. So I thought, well, I could just write some text to it or something, right? So. I wrote an ASCII text file to it. This is really kind of maybe hard to see, but um, and it's kind of washed out. There was a lot of problems with this. Um, it turns out that um, there were a lot of competing standards back in the day, um, and one of those things is ASCII. ASCII uh, nowadays is well, we're, we're now in the Unicode world, and so and I don't, probably don't have to tell this audience about the craziness of Unicode. Um, uh, but back um, around this day and age, we were talking about all kinds of different encoding formats for text. And um, there was ASCII, probably primarily on PCs and PC clones. Uh, IBM mainframes had uh, EBCDIC and some other um, formats like that. Uh, but the Commodore machines all had this thing called Petsky, which was a lot like ASCII, except the uppercase and lowercase were sort of swapped except unless you were doing graphics modes. And you can see on each of these keys, this is from a pet uh, Commodore uh, computer. You can see from these keys, you could also do graphical elements. Uh, some of this stuff is in uh, some of the code pages of ASCII as well, but the Petsky standard had kind of its own thing. So when I wrote a text file to the printer, uh, the uppercase and lowercase would be reversed and that kind of thing, or I would get random graphics. Um, and uh, I didn't quite understand that, but it turns out that the printer itself also could go into ASCII mode. If you send it uh, some special characters before you start printing, it switches everything over to be ASCII compatible. So speaking of which, I, I, I did manage to also have the manual. I've scanned this in and uploaded it to the Internet Archive, which is actually a wonderful resource. When you, uh, I used, um, let's see, I think I used the Google Drive app on my phone and just took a photo of each page. Um, and that sort of was collated automatically. It was actually surprisingly e easy. Uh, it did take a little while, about a half hour, kind of to flip through all 100 pages and take a photo and re maybe retake the photo. But once I uploaded it to the archive, they OCR'd it and made a really nice interface uh, to it. And that was also nice, instead of grabbing for the manual and flipping back and forth between pages, I could just kind of control tab through anyway. But the manual is out there in case anyone needs it. Uh, that was kind of a fun little side project to scan all this in. So I, I, I got pretty good at printing text and whatnot, but I wanted to print graphics. And I, um, I hadn't really read the manual yet or anything. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, something out there has got to print graphics for this. And so I loaded up a Commodore 64 emulator. Um, actually, come to think of it, I didn't think about it. I had a Commodore at that point. I guess I could have turned on the Commodore. But uh, instead, I used an emulator and found uh, uh, an old version of a thing called Printmaster Plus, which was a calendar, greeting card, banner program. Uh, one of the things that it had in the top uh, screenshot here was it actually had a printer driver for a Star 10X, which I think is an earlier model of this printer. So I managed to create a sign uh, using the uh, sort of bank OCR font, which I guess is called Westminster. Um, and uh, the emulator allowed me, once I hit print, to kind of write that to a file and kind of looking at it, it looked like it had the right codes and stuff in it to send to the printer. And that's what I got. I basically just used the uh, command line utility I mentioned before and sort of wrote that out to the printer and it, it started printing these graphics like this. 
Um, so I thought I could go further and maybe turn this into a proper kind of printer for the PC, uh, for, for the Mac and for Linux and other Unix uh, BSD and such. We have the CUPS uh, printing system, which was written by Apple and open sourced. Um, this is where it gets a little fuzzy. I spent a lot of time, I mean, in my recollection of what all happened uh, when I was messing with all this because I wasn't taking it very seriously. It was just something when I was bored and when I thought of it, I would kind of, um, you know, Google around and see what I could do to get this stuff working. So getting it to work with cups, you know, there, there's a the concept of what kind of driver do you use to get this thing working. And um, I looked around, there wasn't a driver for this printer. Um, and at the time, there was such a thing as, as Epson compatible became kind of a thing. Really, I, there were a lot of different competing sort of ways of interacting with a printer. Um, it was more, um, uh, the, the, the companies didn't really talk to each other. There weren't really necessarily too many established standards. Um, being Epson compatible eventually sort of emerged as kind of a standard or being some subset of compatible with Epson uh, command codes and whatnot. Um, the, uh, probably the real thing is that each of these printers behaved in different ways, had different embedded circuit design, and just had different command interpreters. And so if you wanted to implement a feature in a printer, you uh, maybe didn't have an existing um, way of doing that that was out on the market. But there was also probably an element of proprietariness. You know, if you use our printers and our drivers, then you know it'll all work and everything. So I kind of looked around and I just tried like generic nine pin Epson compatible printer. Um, to get this all working between cups and, and this, um, you know, command line utility that I needed to write out to the Zoom floppy and whatnot, uh, there is a Python library that just calls through, um, through C types, the underlying uh, library code for opening the serial port and writing to the serial port of the uh, interface device. And so pretty much everything I could do in the command line I could do with Python code. Also, the, um, the, I started reading more about the manual. It started getting more interesting, the various commands. These are essentially escape codes. Um, escape codes meaning you send uh, the key code for escape, which in ASCII is 27, and then some other kind of code. And depending on the codes that you send, uh, then the printer behaves differently and whatnot. And the manual had all of these in there. So I typed all these into sort of my own Python library. It was something to do, something to get familiar with all these different commands. Um, created some functions that could join these into strings of characters that could be sent to the serial interface. And then just started naming them. Uh, you know, to write a bell, it's, it's, it's character seven. Uh, backspace is character eight. Although nowadays, uh, most character uh, backspace is 127. Uh, but the printer does kind of support like a backspace thing. Anyway, it was very interesting going through all these different things, line feed, form feed, uh, carriage return, et cetera. And then I was able, with that, just with simple Python scripts, to get some of the neater functions out of the built-in text printing that the printer could do. Um, it has built-in fonts, which uh, is a surprisingly uh, a uh, desirable thing at the time. I guess looking back, there, there was so little memory, there wasn't really memory buffers and whatnot. So if you could get the printer itself to render these fonts and whatnot, then you had high speed and you didn't need uh, too much from a computer standpoint. Um, you could just download the text and the printer would print out these things. But you had a lot of opportunities for different fonts, different type quality, underlining, reverse text quite a lot of different features. So it was fun to kind of play around with that, write little Python scripts that would make, uh, you know, some, some interesting different text, wide text, double-sized text, et cetera. Uh, in this uh, research, I found a thing called T4Cups, and um, I believe this is Python-based. Uh, this is an interesting kind of add-on for Cups. Uh, what it is is sort of a post-processor for Cups in the sense that your programs on the network or locally or from your phone will send to the CUPS printer, um, you know, data. And then what you can do with T for CUPS is kind of post-process that in any kind of way that you want. So you print to a file and then this um, library allows you to then say email it somewhere or 
you know, re reformat it in some fashion. And it's, uh, it can be completely Python based if you want, but it sends like the job name, what was the printer that it was supposed to go to, also the data file, which is usually in PostScript and whatnot. Uh, it's really kind of a neat thing. So you can imagine maybe like blogging by printing or something uh, where I just print from my phone and then that somehow gets post-processed and then, and then uh, posted out to the internet. So it's a lot of neat uh, opportunities for automation, maybe even in small business and whatnot. So again, how this works from a software kind of standpoint, data comes into cups, usually this is PostScript or eventually turns into PostScript, um, T um, and also using, using the GhostScript uh, libraries. Then the T4 cups package can kind of send that on to other programs. So then I have a Python library where I can open, you know, this stuff and send special commands like go into ASCII mode or go into, um, you know, different graphics formats and whatnot. And then that gets sent to the device and then the, the device sends that on to the printer. So once I had this set up, again, I had a generic nine pin uh, printer device set up. I was able to get something like this. Uh, so this is uh, true type or open type fonts out of Inkscape, um, and also some simple halftoning as well out of Inkscape. And uh, sometimes this didn't work so well. Uh, and that's because of the aforementioned sort of Epson compatibility problem. Uh, a lot of times I'd try to write things out there and it just wouldn't work or it would stop. Often what it would do is just mostly beep and then eject the paper. Um, so that was pretty common. And that was getting pretty frustrating, and no matter what driver I was using, it would pretty much always, you know, end in failure and stuff. And I kind of became, you know, resigned to the fact that it just wasn't going to work that way, and I was going to have to come up with my own way of processing this stuff. Um, so what does a printer driver do? A uh, printer driver uh, does settings of the printer, connectivity to the printer, uh, does job control, and it also actually then uh, sends and queues and buffers the actual data to the printer itself. Um, a lot of these are, uh, in this day and age, kind of very proprietary in order to kind of lock you in and especially upsell you on ink, I guess, on inkjet printers um, and a lot of other kind of crazy things like that. Um, but essentially, this is mostly what they do, and they've always been sort of an enigma to me. Um, Luckily, uh, Epson had documented most of their protocol. Um, the escape, uh, escape P or Escape P2 standard, uh, ESCP, ESCP2. There's also a format called the ESCPOS, which is used on a lot of thermal printers. I don't know if you have any hobby projects that use thermal printers, uh, but that standard also comes into play even in this day, and a lot of printers still accept this format, and dot matrix printers are still in use quite a bit on in high throughput um, situations and large business and whatnot. So this, this document is freely available online from 1997 that goes through their entire thing. A lot of great theory and stuff. Also, the manual that came with the printer actually talked about what you have to do. You have to send, uh, essentially to the printer, you have to send as, as the head as the head is moving, y you have to essentially tell it which pins are to fire at which time. And you do this by sending a stream of bits. Um, that, and as you can see along the left-hand column, it's, uh, the bits are labeled from 1 to 128. And uh, along the bottom, you can see what we're doing is we're just summing uh, all of the bits that are required that we want to fire. So this is the top left corner of an S. Uh, we would send that string of, of numbers there to the printer and it would fire those and you would do that for an entire row. And each row would be about eight pixels high. And um, as you stream this data in, it just moves the carriage forward and fires those solenoids uh, in time. So there really isn't too much to getting uh, the thing uh, printing. Uh, this seemed interesting enough from kind of first principles or something, and, it, and I felt like if I, could, if I could do just that, then I pretty much have the rest of it licked. So this is the command you send. Um, well, there's several different graphics commands. This is to print single density 8-bit graphics. Um, there's another one where you can just send a code and select which density and which mode you want. You have to specify it how many columns and how many um, maybe uh, 
and that, that the column number has to be like a multiple of um, a certain kind of number, and then you have to also say the remainder then. So there is a, a little bit of math there. Uh, this is identical to the way Epson uh, handles that data as well. But you send sort of your, your um, the number of rows that you're sending, and then you just send all of those bit codes in. And as, as that gets sent to the printer, then that just starts printing uh, an entire thick line. So I play with that a little bit. Um, I u reused a lot of sheets of paper. So here's me trying to get the line spacing just right. Um, the darker lines towards the bottom, you can see I'm kind of overlapping. Some of the ones at the top, I've got a gap between the dots. And then there's some text behind that when I was testing out other uh, things as well. But the, the horizontal grid of dots there was just, you know, can I get you know, a solid black bar to print across the page and do that from code. Then I started getting a little more fancy with that, uh, doing checkered patterns and sort of smaller blocks, um, that kind of thing. And I felt like I had a real handle on how this is supposed to work. So I kind of took a leap of fa faith and just um, started looking at image formats. I knew of this image format. The net PBM format, uh, I was reading about this last night on Wikipedia. So this was originally an image format for email. It's supposed to be a non-binary format so that you could send it in a text email. And no matter what they did to the text in that email, you still could maybe decode the image on the other end. Uh, and it's pretty simple. So it basically says uh, that this is a four by four matrix. And here's the string of dots. And so this is a lot like how NumPy sort of, you know, deals with matrix, matrices. And so you can see the array on the left there. We have a four by four image with ones in, along the left and the top, and that creates that image there on the right. So I'd already kind of been doing that to do um, the, uh, the checker patterns and whatnot. I had created a way to kind of go through each of these columns, sum up the bits, and then so whatever I could get into a NumPy array that was either zero or one, then I could at least you know tell the printer, you know, hey, go, you know, fire all these pins along this row like this. So not really doing much math with Num NumPy, but just you know handling all of these bits. So this was the first picture. This is this is hard to see, but it's of a woman's face, and then I have a close up of her eye. Uh, and this was the first image that I was able to kind of print with Python. Uh, into this printer. Um, when I was watching that uh, Computer Chronicles episode earlier that I mentioned from 1988, the Comdex, there was a group that was selling for, I want to say it was $1,500, which would be almost three grand in today's money. But it was a, a software package for, I think, the prosumer or home consumer to dither images and to take photographs and turn them into, you know, this kind of pixelated graphics, which it, it didn't occur to me that back then, I mean, the methods were known. I looked up like dithering and half toning and that's, that's been around for a while. But it, it just never occurred to me that for small business computing and home computing, it wasn't like a readily accessible thing like in 1987, 88, to be able to dither an image. Uh, and they were talking about using their three gram package to do nice uh, uh, photos for laser and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so, it, you know, this is all kind of a known standard. I used uh, the GNU image processing um, uh, package to create these PBM files. It also has a lot of great dithering uh, settings as well. I was able to kind of do that manually and look at the text file and stuff like that. Um, so it was washed out. It turns out there's an old trick, and I kind of vaguely remember this from a kid, but uh, from being a kid and, and being around these things. But I had to, I, w I was Googling about ribbons. You can actually still get ribbons, brand new, I think, brand new ribbons. I don't know if they've been manufactured in the last few years. But you can get unopened uh, ribbons, let's say, still uh, on the internet for these printers. And, and, and the cartridges work in a lot of different printers. And again, it's kind of a body of, I think, like a fluid or ink or, or um, uh, I don't think it's, it's entirely the pigment. That's, it's more of a, of a fluid that sort of allows the, the pigment to transfer off of the ribbon. It exists kind of mostly in the, uh, the big cartridge area there. So that had dried out with the ribbon that I had. And there's an old trick that you spray a little WD-40 inside of the thing and kind of twist the thing and kind of cycle the ribbon through the cartridge. And that kind of rejuvenates the, the ink in there, the pigment, uh, onto the nylon ribbon. 
uh, that, that is sort of fed. This is kind of like a cassette tape, but I think the ribbon is just mostly kind of bundled up in that side. There's not like a roll of ribbon in there. It's just kind of a big pile of ribbon. So that kind of made a mess uh, because it was a little goopy. It was also very smelly. I should have done it outside. Um, it also kind of took uh, a long time to kind of air out and uh, kind of get to a point where it was less goopy. And I started to get uh, a little more ambitious with trying to print photos and whatnot with the thing. On the left is, um, I think it's a, uh, some kind of relief map, kind of fractal-based thing. And then on the right is a photo that I had of uh, me and my girlfriend from Florida. And uh, as you can see, it still kind of leaves a lot to be desired. It kind of muddies a lot of things. Well, that photo is also backlit. Um, but for the most part, I was able to get some kind of nice usable prints out of this thing. Um, especially if I sort of played around with um, GIMP and, and did a lot of pre-processing of the images and whatnot and tried different uh, various things of the half toning and the, and the dithering of the images and whatnot. So eventually I got to the point where I had uh, kind of written my own driver to an extent. Cups was outputting PostScript, but then PostScript I could modify the ghost script uh, exec uh, executable command line in there to output that PBM format and then, and then launch a Python script that would load that text format. The printer advertises these uh, resolutions and these are all in dots per inch. So 60 um, horizontal dots per inch by 72 vertical dots per inch or, or you could also do 120 by 72. It also emulates higher resolutions, but it actually doesn't fire the pins. Um, I think that was so that you could send it higher resolution graphics uh, and it would print them without a problem. It just, the, the hardware isn't capable of higher resolutions. Also does ASC, ASCII text. Uh, there were several different languages uh, available. The manual had all the different characters that it could print uh, from other languages. Uh, and then it also supported the Commodore uh, languages as well. It also supported downloading custom fonts. And I spent a lot of time with this. And I probably shouldn't have. It was um, kind of at the end of the day, sort of a weird thing. It, it supported uh, proportional fonts and also um, fixed space fonts, you know, monospace fonts. And I managed to get the monospace space fonts working fairly, uh, fair, fairly well. Um, this is uh, one of the fonts that I'm using actually in this presentation, which is silk screen. Um, the problem with the proportional fonts is maybe that I know too much about fonts. And back in these days, proportional fonts just meant that we try to get rid of some of the gaps between the letters on either side. And nowadays, proportional fonts mean you know, pair kerning and, um, you know, outside of the bounding box and, and um, special ligatures, you know, and, and quite a lot of other things. So with the proportional fonts, I was having problems with, for instance, the pipe character. Uh, the way you downloaded fonts into this was a lot like the graphics, uh, where you're printing a graphic, but you're, you're actually sending it just a small grid of, of a letter. Um, and within those bounds of that block, you could say how much space is there to the left and how much space is there to the right. And if you've only got a character that's a single column, then you're gonna have some white space. And there was also kind of some inconsistencies of how it treated uh, these fonts. You'd have to download the fonts from the, from the ROM into the RAM and then overwrite uh, the fonts that were in RAM. Anyway, it was, it was a, lot of, a lot of time spent when really I already had graphics printing and we already have true type and open type and everything. So I didn't really need to do this, but it was kind of interesting at least. And, and the monospace fonts are pretty nice. This is very fast printing perhaps compared to the graphics printing, but um, because it, it will print in both directions. Um, so it was maybe not entirely uh, a bad idea. And the monospace fonts are kind of neat. So, but again, we're living in the future, right? Uh, this is kind of, you know, sort of, um, oh, masochistic or something, right, to be doing this, you know, messing with this old technology, limited RAM, uh, to borrow a phrase from a recent thing that a NASA engineer talked about with the Voyager spacecraft is that we've got technology in our pockets that's, you know, a million times faster, and we're not talking about our phones, right, we're talking about the key fobs that we use to open our cars, right? So 
the this is incredibly primitive technology compared to today, and, and we're living in the future. So one of the things I was able to do was kind of sort of, I think, create sort of a new mode. I looked around in the Windows 95 driver for this printer, which does still exist. Uh, and apparently someone has gotten to work in, in uh, at least Windows 7. Um, but I don't think it has this mode, which is a 120 horizontal resolution with a 216 DPI uh, resolution in the vertical space. Um, the dot sizes themselves are uh, somewhat bigger than 1 216th of an inch. So this can kind of sort of blur things a little bit, but for line art, uh, it makes really, really nice pictures. Uh, on the left, that's a full page view of the uh, a picture from the, of the Gutenberg Press from Wikipedia. Uh, and that's, that's, that was a lot of fun to kind of get that. It, the printer doesn't explicitly support this, but what it does support is a way to move the paper 1 216th of an inch. So how I do that is with interweaving. So if I send a column of eight rows through the printer, what I can do is sort of interweave three sets of those and then advance the paper by 1 216th of an inch. And um, that ultimately then gives you sort of a 24 row resolution in, in the space of what normally would be an eight row uh, resolution. And how we do that is, is with NumPy as well. So the, here's how I'm, I'm doing um, the splits of the rows for each pass of the printer head. And as I basically say, I, you know, for a 256 square image, uh, I need you know, eight rows. I can turn that into splits. That turns into 32 passes of the printer. And each one of those is eight columns tall and then 256 columns wide. So uh, also, uh, then to get the interweaving thing, we have the NumPy slices here. Um, and there we do the split like we did before, except we get 24 uh, rows to do the splits. And then we step through each sort of, um, you know, each, each, every third row, but first starting with the first row, then the second row, and then the third row, each of those being eight columns. So you send that all to the printer, advance it one 216th, send another one. You do that three times, and then when you're done with the three, you do a whole what's left of, of the thing to get down to the, the next row there. So kind of some neat uh, graphics, definitely more photo-like, uh, but you can see on the right there, the zooming in of the eye graphic there, that a lot of the dots kind of overlap each other. And the, the interweaving of the dots is, um, I don't know, a little interesting. It works maybe with some of these lighter images. Um, another thing I wanted to support was a thing called intermediate mode. This is where you hit a key on the keyboard, the printer prints that key, that kind of thing. This was a feature, this was how you interacted with a computer through like the 60s, 70s, or something like that. We didn't have these nice screens, you had a printer and you typed at the keyboard and the printer would print out. You can kind of sort of emulate with this thing. Uh, it doesn't have, it will only print characters when you send it a carriage return. Carriage return doesn't necessarily mean it has to advance the line, uh, but it does clear out the internal buffer. So you can imagine kind of emulating this by keeping track of how many characters you've typed out, hitting carriage return. Uh, it, it seems to be smart enough internally to not go all the way to the, to the, to the, to the uh, left-hand side of the printer. Um, but I don't know, I, I wanna play with that more. It would be kind of interesting to get that to work. And one more thing. So this is the higher end model of this printer. So that means it's a color printer. So, <laughs> right, right, yes, this was high end. Uh, uh, we had a 24 pin printer, but it wasn't a color printer. Um, it, it had this ribbon, it wasn't really CMYK. It was sort of eight colors. Um, and it kind of sort of mixed them internally as well, it had some logic for kind of, um, so the ribbon kind of looking at it, it's, it's not really cyan, yellow, magenta, black, it's kind of this red and anyway, uh, the palette is kind of interesting. This is an example from the manual of how to get some color out of the thing. Uh, and this was done with a basic program that just cycles through the different colors and just sends a square. And of course you imagine this being like a for loop kind of creating this grid of colors. So this is a palette. Uh, I took a photo of it with my camera and tried to sample these. 
I, I originally just sort of took it at face value and said, you know, red is red, green is green, that kind of thing. And the images that it printed out weren't all that great. So instead, and this isn't very precise, but I took a photo of the colors that it was printing and then sampled those and kind of turned into the palette on the left. Also, uh, the, the pillow and whatnot, this isn't, this was kind of hard to dig out. Uh, you, cr you create a single uh, pixel image with the palette that you're wanting to do and then instead of just during the conversion part of an image that's coming in, you actually, it, there's, the function is called quantize and you point that at your reference image with the palette that you need. Uh, what was great was that this created a NumPy index where, where the value inside the, the row and column was the actual index number of the color that I had to send directly to the printer. So now uh, to do color separations, it was basically find me all of the elements in this matrix that equal this number, and uh, instead of true or false, I want that as a one or a zero. And, um, and uh, so color separations were basically give me all the zeros, give me all the ones, give me all the twos, and I had a completely separate matrix with all those colors. So photos, so color photos. Uh, this is a nice one of a, of a um, uh, hot air balloon. Um, Here's one of uh, some Van Gogh artwork. And, uh, and it isn't an inkjet printer. Uh, it's definitely sort of pixelated and grainy and stuff, but uh, is actually able to, to do a halfway decent job. This is, um, I'm sure you could probably do this with a modern, well, with even Windows 95. Um, but, uh, but in 1988, you couldn't do this for sure. Um, so that's it. That's where I'm at with the journey and all of this. Uh, here I got the, the logo and everything printed out there for you. And uh, I guess that's it. Um, so if there's any questions or anything, uh, how much time? Four minutes. Four minutes. Anybody? Got a, video? a video of it? No, I don't. <laughs> sorry. Is I could make a video. Right now? I'm sorry? Is that, did you bring that logo with you? No, I wanted to. It is very heavy. I did bring from 1988 my Model M, which is heavy enough at five and a half pounds. Uh, <laughs> But the printer itself is somewhere around 10 pounds. Oh, the printed, oh yes, yes, I do have that here with me. Uh, let's see, I've got sort of the screwed up graphics there as well, that nice uh, cat picture. Uh, here is the, uh, the logo there, so very nice. Yeah, I'm sure it looks great from back there. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> anyway, and then also that's probably the best uh, color thing. This was an early, this was me trying to say that red is red and green is green. Um, it's a little washed out. It's a little kind of sort of the inverse. This is the Van Gogh. Um, both of these images I had, I don't know what it was. It was sort of the, the some of the black was rendered as white. Um, it could be something to do with the dithering algorithm, looking at the extent of, of the, the gamma of the palette that I've given it and just kind of not doing the right thing. Uh, a lot of true type, type, uh, true type fonts, of course, work great because now everything is just graphics, right? We don't really send text to printers anymore. Um, this is the nice uh, full page um, thing there. So that looks really great. E even, even up close, it actually doesn't look too bad. Uh, there's a little bit of wrinkling from the paper of the, of the ink. Um, this is me trying to figure out the fonts and just not working at all. I need to recycle all this paper. Um, Oh, well, yeah, I typed a lot of this. I mean, I've got a, I've got a Chromebook or something, but yeah, this Model M uh, I ordered from eBay and uh, also got a, a replacement cable, so it goes straight to USB. Yeah, uh-huh, yep, yep, back and forth here. Nice springy keys and everything. So, yeah, uh, the PS2 came out uh, like 87, 88, so about the same age as that printer. Uh, sort of IBM's attack on the clone world. Um, that, uh, oh, uh, another thing to talk about printer drivers. There was an IBM project to kind of create uh, modern CUPS drivers for the, a lot of these old printers. And um, th some of that code is still out there. I couldn't really get much of it to work. It was compiled in, uh, in C with a compiler that is, doesn't really exist anymore. Okay. So. Um, I didn't, I didn't really get any of that working, but it was kind of neat kind of looking through it that at one time IBM uh, tried to create a printer driver for this line of printers for OS2. Um, Has anyone gotten in touch with you on the internet based on, on the 
No, no. I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really talked about it much on the internet, so this is kind of the first of that. I, I do plan on publishing this code onto GitHub and whatnot. I don't know how much useful, how, how much use there would be in it. Maybe some of the, the cups configuration stuff, maybe kind of sort of the, the outline of how to do all of this. But really, if you had any other printer, uh, there, might, there might be a driver for it, or you're going to have to maybe do something completely different to get it working. So, cool. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>